Welcome everyone to the CDT, uh, Sense and CDT webinar. Um, we want to talk to you today about uh, the program and uh, we also have some students here uh, with me. So I think the first thing what we're going to do is an introduction. So my name is Adriana wolf -Berit. I'm the program manager and NRES director of uh, the Sense and CDT. And uh, with me we've got uh, Mohammed uh, to my right. Yeah, so my name is Mohammed al -Awami. I'm a third year PhD student with the Sense of CDT at the Department of Physics. Uh, my name is Hasim Mahmoud. I'm also a third year PhD and I'm with the Terahertz Applications Group. My name is Josephine Tumasili. I'm a first year student with Sense of CDT at the Department of Engineering. Excellent. Um, so now that we've introduced uh, everyone here, um, I would actually like to know who's attending this webinar. So if you want, this is optional. Feel free to drop in the chat uh, where you're from and uh, which university you're currently enrolled in, because we would be really interested to hear uh, where you're based. Um, so I want to show you now the agenda, what we're going to do today. So I've prepared a slide. Um, so we're going to introduce the Census CDT to you. Um, we will hear from the students, their experiences in the Census CDT, have a brief discussion about uh, advantages and maybe disadvantages of CDTs, uh, followed by Q&A questions. So if you have any questions, uh, drop them in. If you cannot stay till the end, this webinar will be recorded. Um, but if you want um, to get contacted by us, uh, feel free to drop your email as well in the chat. And um, we will also, at the end of the webinar, put in our um, email so you can contact us as well if you have any more questions. So I want to show you now on the next slide um, um, about the sense of CDT. So we are an interdisciplinary research uh, program at the University of Cambridge. We are established since 2014 and um, we're in the second round. So every five years, CDTs have to renew um, with EPSRC, and we are five um, CDTs that have managed to secure funding for two rounds um, in Cambridge. And our focus is uh, healthcare and sustainability, um, so sensor technologies associated to that. So far, we've had um, 103 students enrolled in the program um, that have finished or are currently in it. And um, we, uh, as you can see, there are different funding models. And later, when you apply to us, we're going to talk about it. But it is possible to get also industry projects with us. Um, so some of our industry partners are AstraZeneca, um, Hitachi, Fluidic Analytics, uh, and Diamond and AlphaSense. Um, but yeah, really, we are a very interdisciplinary. Um, you don't have to have an electronic engineering background to apply to us. That's probably one of the most common things we hear about uh, it when people contact us because we actually have people from diverse backgrounds. We have biologists, chemists, physicists, biomedical engineers, electronic engineers, um, and so on and so on. So it's, it's very diverse. And um, yeah, we also actually have computational scientists so um, this was the preliminary um, introduction to the Census CDT. And on the next slide, um, I would like to show you um, a little bit more what CDTs can offer you. So CDTs actually offer a PhD plus experience, I, I would say, um, because you get, in addition to um, attending this four year program, you get um, a lot of different uh, workshops and additional training to tailor your needs and 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 um, yeah if you want to go later into the industry we have a, a lot of industry contacts lectures activities if you want to stay in academia or are interested in alternative um, science related careers we are always happy to be there um, as well so it's it's a bit different than a normal PhD and um, specifically because of the MRES year um, that we're going to talk about it in, in a second. Um, but I want to show you briefly uh, on the next slide um, an overview of the different research topics and stakeholders involved in our CET because you might think that um, we have, we, are, we are not doing biology related research maybe or, 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 or yeah. So as you can see in the topics we are really quite diverse 
focusing on technology development, but also middleware and applications. So um, it's, it's very diverse and we have different um, stakeholders involved. We have over 100 uh, PIs uh, at the University of Cambridge associated to us, which can be potential supervisors. Uh, different national bodies we've been working with, for example, so uh, DEFRA is one of them, and we have uh, many different industry partners, and we're going to later hear Hasib's experience about his um, PhD and connection with AstraZeneca. Um, so I hope this encourages you um, to see that we are very interdisciplinary, tackling from many different ways healthcare and sustainability, because we believe that you know being diverse and interdisciplinary really brings a lot of advantages to address uh, global challenges um, in the world. So with that, um, I want to continue on the next slide. Um, so as I said, it's a four year program. So when you apply to us, you have to do the MRES. Um, you might already have an M MPhil, but it's quite crucial that you attend the MRES year um, because of the cohort um, based uh, yeah, training that you'll, you'll get. And we're going to hear a little bit more about it in, in a second. Um, so on the next slide, um, uh, I made an overview of the different components of um, the master year. And now the students are going to explain a few things from their perspectives. Um, so let's start, Mohammed. Tell me about um, the different um, electives that you've been um, taken. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, if I can see the slides. Um. So yeah, uh, the university offers uh, quite a few, uh, or, or the Sensor CDT program offers quite a few electives that you can choose from. And uh, basically those electives uh, are uh, offered from many different departments. You have the uh, CEB, so the Chemical Engineering Biotechnology Department. You have from the Engineering, you have from, uh, I believe, also Computer Science and other departments as well. So it's an opportunity for you to further explore. So I, I put it in, in different ways. So uh, it's an opportunity to first explore new areas, sometimes hot topics that you're not familiar with or you don't have the right background. Sometimes you just want to strengthen your background. Uh, sometimes you want to um, combine what you know with what you don't know in, in a new course. And, and I'll give you uh, some of the examples of the courses that I have taken. And uh, my courses actually are focused on coursework. So all of the courses that I've chosen were coursework because for me, I felt like I've taken a lot of exams already. And also I uh, wanted to further improve my CV. So I was looking for the courses that can potentially support my CV better with some, you know, coursework and things that you can see and can tell, you know, this is what I have done rather than this is my grade. So the courses that I have taken, so uh, the first two uh, were, one was on machine learning and the second one was on climate change. Uh, and I chose those specifically because they were hot topics that I have no idea about. So we hear a lot about machine learning, we hear, we hear a lot about climate change. And both of those uh, are really, really hot topics at the moment. And I felt that, oh, I don't have the knowledge about them. So let me explore them. And I took them, it was very interesting. It gave me all the basics knowledge that I, I need uh, to definitely uh, be very familiar with how things go uh, in those. And uh, got me also interested in uh, one of the startups that I founded was on the climate change and obviously now AI is every every company in a way will add an AI. So those courses really help. The third course that I added the, that I did is uh, biosensors and bioelectronics and this one specifically because it will strengthen a course that I, my knowledge. I already know about biosensors but I didn't know about bioelectronics so it would basically strengthen and bring the bridge the gap between my knowledge in biosensor with bioelectronics, which is also something that could revolutionize some areas like um, brain interference with you know computers and so on. And the final course that I took is bio nanotechnology. This is just to strengthen my knowledge in this topic. It was uh, my bachelor. So my bachelor was on biotechnology. My master was in, in nanotechnology. So this course basically combined my bachelor and master. And I was like, let me see how Cambridge courses 
uh, would work on something I've studied. So it was a very interesting experience for me that I have definitely learned a lot from. Okay, so um, another thing that you're going to do is called Principles of Sensing, and then Sip is going to explain a little bit more about um, that component of the MRES here. Yeah, so the Principles of Sensing module is essentially uh, a series of lectures uh, where we cover a variety of topics given by researchers at uh, the University of Cambridge, uh, as well as industry partners, actually. Um, and it gives a real introduction into the the range of knowledge associated with sensor technology. So we can cover chemical and biosensors, um, as well as optical microscopy. Um, so really, it gives a good background and uh, can really help you gather where your interest lies. Um, and then at the end of the lectures, we go into our groups and um, together you, with the help of Cambridge TV, uh, you come up and design a three minute video um, on the topic that you have chosen. Uh, this is uh, again like a very interesting part of the program because it also tests your creativity. For example, with the video, some people will prefer to do animations. Uh, some people do more simple where they just interview uh, experts in the field. Um, so it really tests um, and there's really no limit to what you can do. Um, so definitely the principles of sensing module. I, I don't know about everyone else here, but it was definitely one of my favorite uh, modules. Maybe just to add to uh, Hasib, it was also a good way to explore what kind of research is done at Cambridge. So different professors would present their research, so you get to know them. And actually, this is how I know about my now current professor. When I saw the talk, I was like, oh, this is something really interesting. And then I, through this lecture, I decided to go to this uh, lab. I didn't know about this lab before. It was the first time I know about it. So it was my way to a PhD, which led to a company. So it was a very interesting outcome through that lecture. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very good. To, <laughs> I'm glad to know because that's the whole purpose that you get an overview, you get to know about the different PIs associated to the census CDT. And then, yeah, some people find their potential supervisor through these lectures. Um, another thing that um, the students uh, do is guided sensor uh, project. So that's really a hands-on introduction to sensors. Um, the aim is uh, to design and build um, a temperature sensor, um, but also a pulse uh, meter um, using Arduino um, and Raspberry Pi. And, and really it's, it's hands-on and it's, it's really useful because later um, another thing will happen called the team challenge and uh, this knowledge is, is quite useful. And it's, it's quite nice because we have also sometimes biologists um, attending um, and, and some that are more specialists in it, like electronic engineers, but together, you know, they, they manage to, to work together and finally have a sensor built. So um, that's another component of the MRES here. Um, then there's something called inclusive innovation and uh, Josephine wanted to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, thank you. Uh, inclusive innovation is more outside engineering. You already know your engineering, your computer science, your, your biological background, but what about the, the real issues that matter in the world? Because most, most likely your PhD may become a business, so you have to have entrepreneurial skills. You have to understand about the things that are happening in the world right now. That is sustainable development goals. They are very key to the 21st century. There are challenges that the world is facing. And how does your work actually help in solving those problems? Then there's uh, another part of it which looks at the ethics about your research. How does your research fit into the ethics of the world? Are you doing something that will benefit others? Are you doing something that is a bit shady? Are you, you know, stealing knowledge from somebody else, so it really helps you to question yourself, what am I, why am I doing this, and what am I trying to achieve in the world. And at the end of it all, you really you do very interesting work. The first part of it is entrepreneurship, where you're, you're actually learning how to define a problem. How do you state the problem? How do you find your niche in the, a very world world of, if you're biotech, what is the part you're trying to solve in biotech, because it's a very, very large world of whatever you decide to do, what are you trying to actually solve? What are really happening in that field and 
how do you come in, how do you work, and what is your market if you're going to business, what is the market if you're going to produce a product that you're trying to reach. So you get to, to think about your project or your work in something of entrepreneurship. And then the second part is really sustainable development and how our work reaches into the, the goals and how we can help the world solve goals. We are at Cambridge, one of the best universities in the world, and we should be really at the very top on solving the challenges in the world. So how does your research get in there and how do you think about it? And then the last part which you do is to think about how your PhD will bring all this together and finally how you, you will work ethically with, during your years here and after Cambridge. So it's a very good thing to not think that I'm an engineer, I don't need this, is to think how does the engineering or whatever you're doing really center into the real world. So that's good. Excellent. Um, another thing is the mini project that uh, you would have to do. It's a three month uh, lab based uh, placement in, in one of the labs in over 20 departments in the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm not quite sure, maybe Hasuk, do you want to? You did your industry mini project, so it was a bit different for you, no? Um, but um, maybe Mohammed then instead, uh, can yeah. you briefly just say sure. about your mini project? Sure, so uh, as I said earlier, I, through the principle of sensing, I found a professor that I want to work with, Professor Ulrich Kaiser, because I saw the talk, it was really hooked me that is something revolutionary. So I went and I talked to the professor and then uh, because the sensor CDT offer a kind of uh, exploratory project, I would call it, maybe this way easier for you to understand, uh, to help you, at least to help me understand is this the right area to do my PhD or not? Is this the right group as well? So through this three, three months project, I uh, basically went to the group, explore it, explore the members there, and then through that I realized, oh, this is what I, what I want to do. Uh, some other members, what they did is, is a bit different. So the sensor CDT gives you a, a, about, I think, what is it, 40 projects? Yes, yeah, oh. something like that. Yes, it mm -hmm. gives you a variety of projects. So if you don't have a project in mind or a professor in mind, they give you a variety of, of, of uh, projects that you can choose from. They can... We also, they come from different departments or from different disciplines, and you can choose, you can explore. Some of the people, some people I know, they chose something uh, that they thought interesting, but then they realize, oh, it's not interesting, or they didn't uh, really fit very well with the group or with the professor, so then they switched to something else after. So it's a good way to explore. So for some people, it turns good that it is the right group. For some, it's, I would say either way, if, if, if if it's the right group or not, either way it's good because you helps you better define. If you find this one, then good. If you don't, then it gives you another opportunity to explore mm -hmm. as well. So it's, yeah. Exactly. Um, then let's move on to the team challenge because that's something um, I think quite unique to our CDT. Um, so, um, yeah, why don't uh, Hasik and Mohammed talk about their team challenge uh, experience? Um, they worked on a project called OkuCamp. Yeah, sure. So uh, OkuCamp is uh, basically a system that we have developed to uh, anonymously count occupancy. And uh, why is that important? Uh, is basically uh, you remember with COVID, we had to limit occupancy. So we had to limit the number of people in a, in a room, right? So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to give an indicator to how many people in a room, especially in CEB, to make uh, the lab uh, safer to work, basically. And what we did is we designed a sensor uh, that can be mounted on... Uh, uh, a door, so this is what the sensor looks like, and I can explain it uh, in a bit. Um, so we put this sensor on the top of a door, and then it basically through heat, because it has a heat sensor, it can count, because when you come in, you can see the heat movements coming in, and then basically it can tell if a person came in or uh, exited a room. And this is how we basically count occupancy, and on the right, you can see a map that we actually developed from scratch, one of our 
uh, team members worked really hard on, on it um, to, to make it from scratch. And uh, there are some requirements that we have to follow, because remember, uh, Josephine mentioned that you know, for inclusive innovation, we have to think about, it's not just about innovation itself, you have to think about the privacy of people, you have to think about you know, that you're not going to be, you know, following them. So you need a passive, passive sensor that is not, you know, with them. That's something uh, uh, is not ident identifying people. There are also other components that, you know, has to be robust, you know, battery power. So there is no need for complex installments, low cost, you know, easy installations and so on. And uh, this is uh, basically the hardware overview. And I'll show you in a second what it looks like in real life. So we had uh, uh, basically uh, the uh, sensor, uh, the thermal sensor that is uh, connected to Arduino. Uh, and then uh, the Arduino is linked to a magnetic uh, door sensor, which is then all of this is linked to Raspberry Pi and, and then Raspberry Pi is connected to the cloud. And why do we have this setup? Basically, uh, the thermal sensor needs something, uh, uh, a computer, uh, to control it, and that's the Arduino. It's a basic uh, computer. And then, obviously, you need a battery for the Arduino. Uh, but the, because the Arduino consumes a lot of energy, what we decided to do is to use a magnetic door sensor. So it's only turned on when you open the door, basically. And then, uh, uh, yeah, so it... it and then uh, this saves energy. And then the uh, Raspberry Pi is basically uh, takes the data and then send it uh, to the cloud. And then maybe if I can get the camera on myself, uh, I can show you uh, what it looks like. So this is the casing of the sensor. So here you have the, uh, uh, the heat sensor. It's, it's, it's small from this side, but then it's a bit larger from inside. And then here is the Arduino. And then the, the battery, it's, as you can see, is quite large, but the Arduino kills it. That's why we have this magnetic door sensor. So you can attach it, and there's another part to it. So if, if the field that changes, it uh, turns on and off. And here is the Raspberry Pi. So this is the whole setup. And just to tell you maybe something interesting about the ecosystem, why I believe you should go for Cambridge and maybe other top universities also, you'll have the same. The ecosystem is very important. We thought that this is impossible. We thought that we cannot do this, even though we're Cambridge PhD students. Uh, and uh, my uh, <laughs> cohort mate, uh, Hasib, I remember when we were like, oh, this is too difficult. It's COVID. We don't see each other. How can we do this? It's an impossible thing to do. And he said something that was really key to push us. So he said, you're all Cambridge students. You can do it. And then it was a silent moment. And we said, oh, we realized, oh, we actually can do it. So the ecosystem is incredibly, incredibly important. And I realized this a lot in other projects. Ecosystem is very important to help you realize your potential. So that is one of the things that is not advertised with the sensor CDT, but you feel it. Just to build on what Mohammed had mentioned about the team challenge. Um, like from my personal experience, what I was involved in our project uh, was web development, which I have had no experience in prior to that. So on one front is um, the team challenge is a good opportunity to learn new skills and um, I ended up really enjoying the coding aspect and uh, I was also involved in like the design, the color scheme. Um, and this away from like the science and engineering and maths, um, it was a good opportunity to learn these new skills and see how how I would find it. And then also the opportunity for working in a team and constantly pushing each other uh, to keep going and reminding ourselves that um, you, we can achieve quite a lot, even given the circumstances around COVID. Uh, I think we had quite a successful project. Um, was useful in the department uh, in monitoring the room occupancy. Um, so definitely the team challenge provides a lot of different opportunities. Yeah, so just to quickly to debrief on the outcome. So there was a lot of outcome, as, as we said. So we built a device that was pretty accurate, about 70% accurate. Obviously, if we have longer, we were in working person, this would be uh, improved. 
uh, uh, other things other than what Hasid mentions. Obviously, uh, you learn how to design projects, execute them with a time deadline, which was very useful for me in my startup and other initiatives. Teamwork and resilience, pushing each other. You know, the power of innovation and, and problem solving together. And again, like Hasib said, again, practical skills, electronics, programming, and more. Excellent. And you only had, what, 12 weeks uh, to 12 do this? 12 weeks yeah. online, yeah. you know. Online during from lockdown, home, from yes. home. I think uh, that's really, really amazing. Yeah. Let's hear from Josephine, because Josephine is from the 2021 cohort. Um, she worked on uh, the team challenge called Ciano Vision. Um, uh, so we can see the slide here, but she also brought uh, their prototype, uh, actually. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Adriana. And yeah, unlike my other friends, we, we didn't have lockdown. <laughs> so it was face to face, but we still had 12 weeks, which is still a tight time to finish a project. But yes, we, as you can see uh, from here, that uh, we, as you've seen that system diagram that we've shown you under systematics, we managed to develop a microscope, 3D microscope. And what was uh, really fun about this is that we were trying to find something that is cheap, it was already done by Open Texture, but we are trying to modify it, the design, and also do it ourselves. And we managed to really produce it. <laughs> As you can see, that is clearly up. It's not an uh, imagined paper. That's the Bill's 3D printer that we that we printed. It, it can be printed very cheaply, and you can see we added modern stuff like what you can see. That is the pump. That uh, the, the point of this actually was to monitor cyanobacteria in water. Why cyanobacteria? Cyanobacteria is good, very good algae. It's used to, you know, manufacture energy and everything, but it also has a side that it, it produces toxins, and if they get into the water system, they can actually harm human lives and animals. So we are trying to say, can we actually detect the cells in that water? So what you see here is a pump. It pumps water from a water source through this system, it gets cleaned, filtered out, and then it's imaged by the microscope. And then we send the images through our, we, we, we use a Raspberry Pi, it takes it to, it is, we have a, a machine learning program, as we, Muhammad already said, machine learning is very important these days, where we, that we have an algorithm that looks at those images and try to identify if that is cyanobacteria cells in the, in the water. And then it can be it can go on to be checked further to see if that the type of cyanobacteria in water is actually toxic or not toxic because we cannot tell at this stage when we are imaging. But beyond that, at least the presence allows us to know that there is some danger, and we can go further and look at it. So that's a finished product. Uh, uh, not really finished. <laughs> about again about seventy percent done. We managed to do bright field for those who are very conversant with microscopy. We tried to do the bright field setup. We also tried the fluorescence one, but it wasn't very successful. So we decided to focus something on one thing, which again, the whole CBT helps you to prepare now from how the things come connecting from entrepreneurship where you define your problem and know your niche. Now here you have to understand, I have 12 weeks, what do I focus on? What can we deliver in 12 weeks? There are a lot of things you can deliver, but what can we deliver? So. We ended up delivering a bright field 3D printed microscope, which at the moment cyanobacteria you can know is very diverse, but it can detect something in water. If it has a unique morphology, it will detect it through imaging. So again, to add to all my friends, the very thing I took away from the challenge is working with your cohort. Uh, they all have different skills, as you said, it's a diverse program. I came in with electrical engineering, we had people in computer science, people from biology, but we came together to do this together and we just learned from each other. Then we had experts within the department and outside that were there to help us. So when you didn't know something, you talk to them, they give you knowledge about it. And also it helped us to, to just prepare for our PhD because it, at the end of it all, you're going to work within a, within a group, a research group. Though you're working individually, you have to work with other people to, to make sure that that we as you can actually produce what you say you will produce. So I could encourage you if you join the CBT that you really participate and you challenge yourself. Don't stay on things that I already know. I did. I read the biology part of this, and I've never. I was. I was with an electrical engineer. So challenge yourself. Have fun.
and enjoy your summer. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Josephine, very much. I mean, it's it's very intense, but it's still at the end really amazing to see that you come up with with um, yeah a product. And yeah, it's it's not easy, but working together in a team, I think that's that's a really nice thing and brings cohorts even uh, closer because then uh, after all the things that we've explained that are happening in the Embrace here, we go on for the PhD. So the PhD uh, with us is a three-year PhD. And how it works, as Mohammed briefly said, in, we uh, propose, uh, or yeah, our supervisors propose a, a long list of different projects that you can do. Um, and then you can do your PhD with uh, yeah, one of those supervisors in our network. And we have students in 20 different departments in Cambridge, so it's very interdisciplinary. Um, and um, yeah, and then we have often uh, events to bring people together during the PhD as well. But um, given the time, let's uh, hand over to Mohammed, who wants to talk about uh, his PhD experience uh, as he's a third year PhD yeah. student at the minute. Yeah, sure. So, uh, as I said earlier, so continuing the story. So, it started from the principle of sensing, and then it went to choosing a supervisor, and then did the mini PhD, and then realized this is the right project. And because I also maybe is uh, uh, a bit different maybe than other student or other students is that I had in mind that I want to start a company. So it's like, is this the right research project that I want to do to start a company? So I talked to my supervisor, I cleared, before we start my PhD, I told him my goal is to develop something that will turn into a company. And this is what came out. So my research project, turned into a company that we call Cambridge Nucleomics. As soon as I joined the group uh, in 2019, which was when I started my PhD, we built a business case, and then we started developing the company since, and the company basically, and, and this is pretty much what I do in my PhD, so instead of explaining each individually, this combines both, so you'll understand my PhD project and the company. So what we do in the company is we develop uh, uh, technologies to analyze RNA and we, our goal is to become the gold standards of RNA analysis. So why are we looking into RNA analysis? Our technology is really capable of doing many different things, but we focus on RNA because we can change uh, how things are done, basically. So we can revolutionize this field. So just to tell you what RNA is, so RNA is a, a, a smaller copy of DNA. So you start from the DNA a DNA is copied into a smaller portion so of RNA, and then RNA is turned into protein. Most of the drugs are targeted toward proteins, so there is a, a protein has a shape, and then you, the drug can fit inside the protein to prevent it from have, uh, uh, um, working, for example. But as you can see, this is kind of difficult. Some drugs, you, can, you cannot find, some, uh, sorry, proteins, you cannot find a drug that you know, fits within that key. But if you go a step back to the mRNA stage, then uh, mRNAs basically can be uh, druggable easier because you can easily design things. It's much easier to design. So you can potentially design drugs that uh, can, uh, to diseases that are undruggable. And this is what we are uh, helping. So we're not developing the drug ourselves. We're helping pharma companies by providing a new analysis tools to improve their drug discovery process. So when it comes to drug discovery, uh, we there are three things that pharma companies are looking into. So they look into, again, where the drug binds. So we can help them find where the drug is better, uh, so locations of where the drug binds to the mRNA. And then we, if they have, they usually then design many different drugs, hundreds of thousands of different drugs, and then they test which one basically binds stronger, which one is better uh, in terms of an effect, and then this is something also we can do. And finally, they want to see how stable it is in the body, and then this is something we can do. And I, would, I can uh, say that our technology is the first technology that can do all of these, uh, and we provide a new insight that no other technology can provide, and our goal is to speed up the drug development and help them in the de-risk. So uh, this is how the technology works, and this is what I do in my PhD. So we combine two technologies. We combine nanopore sensing with uh, DNA uh, origami. So basically what we do, if you have an RNA sample, RNA drug, 
we mix it with our chemicals which are DNA based uh, and they bind together and then we measure them with our reader which is a nanopore. And a nanopore is basically a very small channel that can basically scan strings. And this is on the right, you can kind of see the signal and then through the signal we can get the properties of the drug. So uh, uh, this is our uh, team and basically we, uh, uh, again you know the story, we started with uh, Professor Ulrich and then uh, me and, and Professor Ulrich and then the team built around that and now I'm the CTO of the company focusing on uh, developing the technology and just maybe something to worth uh, uh, noting here that you know these things all come together and help you make something that could potentially be impactful in your career I was selected as top 21, uh, 21 to watch innovative people in Cambridge and East England uh, uh, based on, on this uh, startup. So you see your PhD can turn in a company which can establish your career earlier before you graduate. Excellent. So um, let's move over to actually um, Hasif briefly explaining um, his PhD experience. Um, because that was with AstraZeneca, right? Yeah, so as Adrian mentioned, I'm actually in partnership with AstraZeneca, so I thought I'd give more of an insight in how an industry partnership would look like. Um, so right from the off, uh, the, the uh, it was advertised as a PhD with uh, AstraZeneca as part of the Sensor CDT, so the application is um, slightly different. Uh, and then in my master's year, I actually did my mini project in the same lab, so the terahertz uh, applications group. Um, so then when it came to my actual PhD, um, I already had a little bit of background in the lab, so I didn't, the introduction and stuff was a lot quicker, uh, as I was already familiar with my lab mates and the sort of work we do. Um, so in my first year, I would say that was more like a lot of literature reading. Um, so my PhD topic is using terahertz spectroscopy to analyze the stability of pharmaceuticals. Um, so in the first year, I would say the involvement from AstraZeneca would be, they would they had suggestions for what drugs I could look into. And then if I had some of my own ideas, uh, they also helped source these drugs. And uh, if it was more difficult for us to obtain, they would be able to help with their connections. Um, so with the industry partnership, that's obviously useful um, with what connections they have and um, they can help source materials that you need. Uh, but yeah, the first year was more of a steady introduction and uh, sort of planning the PhD out properly and then starting the experimental work uh, with some solid literature foundations. Uh, and then in the second year, uh, as I would get more results from my experiments, this leads to opportunities like uh, presenting posters uh, and giving oral presentations at conferences uh, for example, one being the census day that's hosted every day, every sorry not day, every year, um, organised by the census DT. This again is a good opportunity for the people amongst the different cohorts uh, to present their research and topics, um, and also conferences. Uh, for example, I went to one in Finland, which was very helpful. Also, good to see the uh, see a new country, um, and again build connections and meet new people and. Uh, see what sort of work other people are doing and if you can connect it to yours. Um, and I also got to visit uh, the AstraZeneca site in Cambridge and again see what sort of work they do uh, both in their research centre and then also uh, by presenting my work there. Um, there was the potential for interaction with people working at other sites uh, at AstraZeneca across the country whether it be research, uh, biological, or even with manufacturing and process engineering. Um, and one of the things I can say that's definitely helpful with industry is, uh, as well as them being focused on your research and how you're performing on your PhD, uh, they also keep your mind on what you want to do next as well. So uh, from my personal experience, my supervisor from AstraZeneca, um, he's constantly asking uh, where I see myself next, what. I'm interested in whether I want to stay in research, uh, academia, or if I want to go back to industry. And then you can also assist in if I want to remain with AstraZeneca, whether um, I want to switch sites or look into what else they're doing and then uh, build connections with people again 
and meet people and present my work and see really where I can carry on with this even beyond the PhD. Um, so I, as an overview with industry partnerships, one is the building connections, one another thing is then helping you really plan what you want to do and obviously with um, with the PhD aspect, uh, they have a range of resources that can help you. Excellent. Um, before we go over to, um, you know, at the application and how it works and what is the deadline and how it works for international students and so on, um, I wanted to highlight um, the Reach Sci initiative. Um, and we have prepared a few slides for that because um, Mohammed initiated this organization and uh, the 2019 court has been yes. also been Very involved. Um, so I think that's uh, quite a nice thing uh, to bring in as well because, um, you know, obviously people are doing their PhDs, but we have fabulous students that do so many things on, on, on their side as well. And ReachSci is one of them. And I also actually want to uh, thank ReachSci because they've been helping us to promote so this event. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much. So um, let's uh, move to the slide. Um, if we can. Yeah. So uh, while we move to the, okay, there you go. So ReachSci is uh, now as a Cambridge University Society. That again we started uh, uh, with the cohort. Um, so the cohort helped a lot. So this is another benefit of the cohort. So initially, I I, wa I was initially trying to start it alone, and I realized. You know, uh, it's not as easy to start things alone, not just because it is in terms of work, but also in terms of ideas. You need people to criticize you, tell you, no, this is not good, push you, you know, move your ideas around. It, it gets really, really helpful. And this is, uh, and many other things that also the cohort help with, which help establish uh, the society. So uh, now the society is, is much larger than with, when we started. So when it started, it was, First me, then we added the cohort, so we were nine. And now we combine uh, people from around the world and also from different universities. So what we're trying to do, as you have seen earlier from our motto, is we try to uh, uh, help people become research champions, especially underrepresented students. And uh, how do we do this? We combine expertise from top universities. So we have Cambridge, we have Harvard, and also we added Stanford lately. So we're trying to bring in all this expertise and research um, uh, together to come up with the really high quality research. And the organization or the society has grew a lot. Now we have more than 150 volunteers in 14 countries and we're also starting to, to make new hubs. Uh, so like uh, branches around the world as well. Uh, these are our board members. Obviously you always need support from board members and again, the sensor CDT helped a lot. Help, they helped us with a Zoom account initially. They helped us with feedback. They helped us with funding that helped us definitely go from, they helped us with, uh, you know, uh, also advice, advices and so many things, you know. It's, it's, it's just incredible what uh, the uh, uh, program has provided in terms of help. And again, what we do is basically we aim to en uh, enable underrepresented individuals to do outstanding research. So we focus on anybody from any underrepresented background in research to improve their skills in research. And how do we do this again? We aspire to offer the best accessible research training in the world by combining all these expertise from top research institutions and also combining expertise from locals because sometimes you think that, oh, I bring this from the West to, for example, somewhere um, in the global south, it not necessarily work. You have to understand what also their solutions, combine your solutions with them, and then come, some, come up with something innovative. And we, our goal is to enable anyone, anywhere to do outstanding research, or at least this is our vision. And again, how do we do this? We have a program, we call it the mini PhD, because we try to bring everything we learn through our PhD to this program. Uh, and the eight-week program basically teaches you everything from the research proposal all the way to uh, writing the, uh, uh, your uh, report or paper, you know, all the whole things. And we also uh, uh, include uh, development, the, uh, uh, professional skills, interpersonal skills, marketing skills as well. Because if you are going to, uh, even if you're the best, and we have seen people from 
the global south, for example, they're incredibly, incredibly good at research, but the, their problem is they cannot advert. They always feel either because sometimes you're like, oh, I want to be humble, uh, you don't market yourself well, or sometimes they don't know how to do it. So you always have to market yourself, you know, uh, to, to get there. People are not going to know you. So you always have to put that in the account. So yeah, we cover everything. We learn through our PhD and we try to provide more to help support uh, them. And uh, this is uh, basically the program. Uh, just really quickly on our program. So our programs are not just uh, 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 teaching and workshops. We combine this also with uh, a research project. And uh, the research project is uh, basically focused on uh, six UN goals. And uh, all of those uh, are on a global challenge. So we always focus on a global challenge. So with our program, you're first going to learn the skills and then you're going to apply it on a global challenge with the goal to hopefully also get a publication that is impactful to uh, locally or even uh, globally. And uh, just few examples of some of the programs we have done. So we, this is so, uh, the first program we've done in the UK. It was focused on indoor air quality. So we're looking into uh, kind of uh, uh, suspected uh, harmful particles. So we gave the devices to the students and this was during COVID. So they did uh, the testing in their homes. And uh, yeah, it went, it went very well. And we realized that this program uh, can actually uh, be impactful to the students. The students really like it, they thought they learned a lot, and this helped us realize, oh, this can be very helpful. And something interesting here, the device that they used was actually developed by a sensor, CD, by sensor CTT suit, I think it's 2017 cohort, so the Open Seneca device. So you see things are connecting here, we're developing a program, we're using a device from another cohort. It's, it's very, very uh, uh, connected, I, I would say, uh, program, and I, I love how, uh, um, uh, Adriana mentioned it's a PhD plus. It's definitely a PhD plus. You learn a lot more, I think, than other just PhD programs. And uh, there is also another program. So the first program, the pilot program we run was in Ethiopia. We run the same thing. We were trying to test does our program actually work only in the UK or can we actually do it globally? And it was also a very nice project. We, they got really interesting result. They use a device that looks kind of similar to uh, Josephine device uh, from uh, a company, uh, a non-profit company, as far as I know. It's called Waterscope. And one of the students that works there was also a sensor CT oh, student. Oh, so. see, <laughs> there is all connected. <laughs> and, and they come together, which is very nice, you know. So yeah, these are about uh, our project. So um, now we, after this, we run global programs. So now uh, this year we have run programs in uh, about 20 countries. We have uh, more than 80 professors uh, in 36 universities around the world um, where we run the program. We run three different programs after that one. And uh, this one was focusing on uh, uh, glucometers. And uh, glucometers are basically devices that measure uh, blood glucose and basically you see here we're coming back to uh, sensors because we've seen actually through my experience as a sensor CDT that sensors uh, are everywhere and you can do research pretty much with the very very basic resources on sensors and they can be very impactful in our life so yeah these glucometers have a problem sometimes with accuracy precision and interference so the students have been looking into the precision and interference around the world. So how are, how is, how precise are devices and how good are they around the world? These are our advisors, and uh, uh, some of some of them are uh, some of the best in the world who are, are uh, working in glucometers. And uh, these are some of our students. So what they do basically, they prepare blood samples and then they test them using different glucometers. Um, and uh, these are other students. So we had students, you know, from all the six continents, which was really nice to see. Uh, if this is our first run to do global programs. These some are uh, some of our, the posters. I think the students did really well in terms of some of them haven't done posters in, in, in their life. 
coming up with really good, good quality posters. And uh, we have also a, a conference that we do. Uh, our next conference is going to be in March at CEB. Again, uh, this program helps you even uh, with you know, other things that where we're going to run the conference at CEB. Uh, and we're hoping to bring people from uh, about 30 countries. And uh, you're also welcome to uh, register once we, we open. Um, and next year, we are aiming uh, to go bigger. We're aiming to reach more than, so now we've reached more than 200 students around the world. Next year, we're aiming to reach uh, more than 1,000 and offer a different variety of projects. So we will offer wet lab, dry lab, mixed, office-based, and so on. And uh, there are also other things. So we expanded a lot more. Uh, we have programs for school now. We have done a few programs in the UK and around the world for school students. Uh, because we realize also uh, you need, they need, students need earlier preparation. So we have a new program called Reach School for uh, high school students. And we have also a new program called Reach Able for disabled students because they're really underrepresented. So we've designed uh, programs specific for disabled students uh, from all the different spectrums to help them you know, develop their research skills and increases their chances and opportunities to explore research. And also this one we aim to offer to 16 countries by the end of 2023. And finally, we also have uh, something else. We started a program called Reach Career to help students basically or, and, and people in academia to help them develop in throughout uh, their career. And that's it. Um, yeah, that's about ReachSci. We also have something else in ReachSci called ReachX where we help students locally design projects that help them. And yeah. Yeah, and there's it. also uh, uh, Muhammad's email address on the screen. So yeah. if you want to get in touch and learn more about ReachSci, please do. I mean, we're just uh, very grateful. And it's, it's really nice to see how students, you know, uh, follow their interest and, and initiate these great organizations. Um, on, on side of their studies. So I think, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, Thanks that's for your support really well. amazing. Um, all right, so let's um, go now to, we have prepared one slide about the different uh, applications, um, so how to apply with the census CET. So um, these are questions we commonly get asked. So um, if you have a first or upper second class uh, on a uh, degree or equivalent in a relevant undergraduate course, uh, for example, in natural sciences, engineering, computer science, medicine, um, please apply, um, yeah, in general, I would just say, please apply, don't get discouraged. Um, and if not, there are great research uh, opportunities and programs like ReachSci where you can, you know, um, back up your CV and, and the yeah, chances to get uh, fully funded studentships increase. So the fully funded uh, studentships that we offer, so every year it's um, roughly 10, um, are for UK students, um, however, they can be also given to international students. But the difference between the international and UK fees needs to be found. So how it works is when you apply um, through our um, website, so you can see the link down there as well, but we're going to post it later in the chat as well, is that um, you'll be given an option of different scholarships you can apply through the University of Cambridge. And um, if you're successful in interview, we can put you forward for these um, uh, scholarships. So that could be an option, how to get extra funding. You could look into um, different uh, scholarship uh, programs. Um, so for example, Mohammed, um, you have a scholarship yeah. from um, this Saudi, Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So that is also possible. Um, have a look uh, or get in touch uh, with us um, um, about different um, um, scholarships. But there's also something called the International Fee Bursary. So 30% of the students that we take in every year can be covered through this um, scheme. And that is automatically when you apply to us and you do well in an interview, we can put you forward again. So that's how um, the difference between international fees and the UK fees are being covered. And that's, for example, in uh, Josephine's case, how she got the extra funding. So really, my advice is 
just try. It's it's such a unique, great um, thing. So when I did my PhD, I didn't know about CDTs, but having worked here, um, I mean, I think it's such an incredible experience. And as I said, there's so many opportunities and it brings really out the best in our students. And it's it's great to see also the cohort and, and that people stay in touch um, because you might be coming maybe from a different country, you don't know anyone. So it's nice to have a, a network. Um, so please do apply. The deadline is the 5th of January. If you have any questions, get in touch uh, via this email um, with us. But um, I'm not quite sure, let's see if that works. Um, we'll have a look if you have any questions and posted it in the chat. Uh, we can try to answer some of them. Um, so let me just quickly have a look. Um, yes, we have a few. Um, so I can see that somebody asked um, about visas. Um, that is, um, so visas, usually international office deals with this. If you have any questions about uh, visas, I think that's usually um, where they have the information. Um, do you have any recommendations or advice about the statement of interest? Um, actually, maybe yeah. any one of you have sure. maybe some advice about that. So I would say, uh, for me at least, and the advice I would give about a statement of interest is try to find a gap within your CV or, or you know, uh, career development and see how is the sensor CDT going to fill the gap. So for me, I had a clear gap that I felt the sensor CDT probably the one of the only programs that can fill this gap. So I tried to make it very clear for them that this is the gap and you are going to fill this gap for me. And my gap was, so I started a few companies before, but I had problems with uh, um, planning and execution because I ha didn't have the right experience. Because so deep tech startups, you need really depth in depth knowledge. So this is what I wanted to gain from the sensor CD. How do I uh, plan and execute projects of high quality really well? And I've already gained that uh, about halfway through the program. Just to add on to that, I would also like to mention uh, to really like showcase uh, your passion and that you're passionate and interested uh, in sensor technology. Um, and in addition to what the CDT can offer, I'll also mention what you can offer and what you can build on or what you hope to build on through the CDT. Um, because I think yeah, showcasing your passion comes across really well in, in the application. Yeah, definitely. Another thing is um, in the application, it also asks, and that is optional, about a preferred supervisor. Actually, we encourage people to enter the program with an open mind. Um, because you'll meet so many different supervisors and uh, your interest might change in this year. Um, so we really encourage you, um, you can put in a name if you already have somebody in mind, but um, we cannot guarantee that you will get that supervisor um, because of different reasons. But um, yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people ask us as well because um, yeah, it, it looks like it's mandatory, but it's actually an optional part in, in the application. Um, so could you explain the interview process? What does it involve and how could we prepare? So the interview process is uh, usually with uh, three committee members um, and um, yeah, just asking you about what you do and uh, why you're interested with us. And obviously there are a few um, technical questions um, which you know um, we cannot um, uh, say here. <laughs> But really, I think what's important is to show that you are passionate, that you are uh, open-minded, you have an interest, uh, you care about healthcare and sustainability. Um, I think that's uh, that's quite important. I'm not quite sure if any one of you has some more advice about the interview. Yeah, as far as I know, different students had different experiences. I think some of us were a bit te more technical. Um, mine was less technical. Um, it was about my experiences a lot and what I've learned and what the sensor CDT can bring, I think. Uh, oh, sorry. 
uh, I think it's just that the, the interview is just confirming what you wrote in your application pretty much. So don't lie <laughs> because they'll cut you there. So many people try to amp up their CV, say stuff they've never done because they're going to ask about that. So and have just speak through it if you wrote it and it has been in your life because as they said about how to show your interest, finding a gap is having gone through what you've done until this point and then this is where now you need to go. So in the interview, the people are just trying to understand it from now, from what you wrote. Is it true? And how do you say it now to them face to face? So tell your story well, be prepared. If it's your story, then you really don't have to, to worry so much about it. It's what you've learned, it's what you've done, it's what you want to do. If you have those three, then I think you'll be good. Excellent. Okay, uh, with that, um, we have put our email into the chat. So if you have more questions, um, please uh, feel free to contact us. And thank you very much uh, for doing this live webinar uh, with me. Uh, it's sure. been really interesting and nice yeah. experience. So, um, and yeah, good luck to add anyone interested uh, to apply. Uh, we're looking forward to receive your applications. All right, then uh, goodbye. Bye. Good luck. Hope to see you. some Hope of you here. Hope to see you soon. <laughs>